ventilation here. Okay. All right. So some of you may not know this song. It's called the Jayaratamadava song. And it's uh, a song written by one of our great teachers, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who's the father of Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master. He lived in the mostly the 19th century. And it describes uh, Krishna in Vrindavan, Jaya Radha Madhava. Radha's, uh, Radha's uh, Krishna's uh, dear most beloved on the altar there. Her appearance day is coming up on Tuesday. And Madhava is the name for Krishna. Kunja Bihari means they who enjoy pastimes in the forest of Vrindavan. Uh, Gopi Jana Vallabha, he is uh, the most beloved of the gopis. Gopis are the coward milkmaids who he uh, plays with in Vrindavan. Giri Vadadhari, this is especially a nice name for this because this is whole temple memorializes a pastime of Krishna's in which he lifted a great hill and protected all of his cow cows and coward friends from a big storm. So Giri Vada means the best of hills, Govardhan, and Dhari, the lifter of Govardhan. Giri Vadadhari. Yashoda Nandana, the beloved uh, son of Yashoda Mata, his, his mother in Vrindavan. You showed Anandana, Braja Jana Ranjana, he who delights all the residents of Vrindavan with his pastimes and his love. Yamuna uh, Tira Banachari, uh, he enjoys pastimes on the banks of the Yamuna, dancing and all kinds of things. So we'll sing a couple of stanzas of that and then we'll speak about various boats that help us cross over the ocean of nations. Jaya Radha Madhava. Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Marava Kunjabi Hari And Gopi Janavala Bha Giri Vardhari Yashoda Nandana Vrajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Mr. Pad, Paramahansa, Padrika, Charger, Stotor, the Shishi, Mana, Divine Grace, Shila, E.C., Bhakti, Vedanta, Swami, Baba Pad, Kijai, Iskan, BBT, Founder, Charger, Shida, Baba Pad, Kijai, Jai Mishnu Pad, Paramahansa, Padrika, Charger, Stotor, the Shishi, Mana, Divine Grace, Shila, Bhakti, Siddhanta, Saraswati, Thakur, Kijai, Ananda Koti, Vaishnava, Nikijai, Nama, Charger, Shida, Haridas, Thakur, Kijai, Krishna Fest, Kijai, Samaveda Bhakta Vindiki Jai. All glory to the Assam of the Bodhis. All glory to the Assam of the Bodhis. All glory to the Assam of the Bodhis. All glory to Sri Guru and Goranga. So, on this 23rd day of August 2020 in San Diego, uh, speaking at the Sunday Krishna Fest in this time of COVID 19. And um, tonight the theme is various boats. Boats that are, will help us to cross this ocean of birth and death. And so first of all, I'd like to read a little bit from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text 36, uh, which talks about the boat of knowledge. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Reading from Srinu Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. Chapter 4, text 36, concerning the boat of knowledge. I'll just read the Sanskrit myself. 
Api chet asi pape bhya, sarve bhya papa krittama, sarvam jnana plavenaiva, vrijinam santarishasi. So this is Krishna speaking to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kruchetra. Even if you are considered to be the most sinful of all sinners, when you are situated in the boat of transcendental knowledge, you will be able to cross over the ocean of miseries. I'm going to read this short purport. Proper understanding of one's constitutional position in relationship to Krishna is so nice that it can at once lift one from the struggle for existence which goes on in the ocean of nescience. This material world is sometimes regarded as an ocean of nescience and sometimes as a blazing forest fire. In the ocean, however, exp in the ocean, however expert a swimmer one may be, the struggle for existence is very severe. If someone comes forward and lifts the struggling swimmer from the ocean, he is the greatest savior. Perfect knowledge received from the Supreme Personality as guided is the path of liberation. The boat of Krishna consciousness is very simple, but at the same time, the most sublime. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chukshur Udminatam Mena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha I was born in the darkness of ignorance, but my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisance to him and all members of Sri Parampara. So, the first um, necessity for appreciating these boats, beginning with the boat of knowledge, of transcendental knowledge, is to understand that we are in a dangerous situation, sometimes likened to this ocean. We're very close to the ocean here. And uh, everyone knows that uh, you go out on a boat in the ocean and it's inherently an unsteady situation. It can come, a storm can come up or this boat can uh, spring a leak and uh, suddenly it's a terrifying situation. So the Vedic literature, beginning with Bhagavad Gita, teaches us that uh, our situation in this material world is not our natural situation, that uh, we are by nature spiritual beings. This is the first lesson of Bhagavad Gita. That uh, we ourselves are pure spirit. Sometimes we're called uh, uh, jiva, jivatma, which is likened to a little uh, particle. The, 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 the size of the, of the jiva soul is, is infinitesimal, one ten thousand part of the tip of a hair. And uh, and yet it animates this body. And the first lesson in the Bhagavad Gita practically is that your eternal soul, you never die, you were never born. And the implication is, and the fact is, that we have lived many lives before and we will have future lives. I like to compare our life that we have, we're all in, in, in a, some material body, to a very uh, short chapter in a very long book. And we, don't, we forgot what all the previous chapters were and we don't know what the chapters are coming. But in this human form of life, because it's not just human beings that uh, are pu pure spirit, soul, and essence, but all, every time you see uh, any living being, whether it's an insect, a bird, a, a tree, a flower, anything, there's a soul in there. And, and this is a very sobering, because every one of those souls was once in a human form. And indeed, every one of those souls was once at the right hand of God in this, what we call the spiritual world, or Goloka Vrindavan. And somehow or other, we turned away from our relationship with Krishna, and we got swallowed up by this illusory energy called maya. Maya means uh, what is not illusion. And ever since, we've been going from one body to another, struggling for existence, trying to eke out a little happiness, and finally succumbing to either old age or some enemy or disease or whatever it may be. And the body dies, it's just a machine, and we go on to the next body. Now, only in the human form of life do we have what is called karma and karma results. Because the lower, uh, the lower forms of life, they're just going on automatic. We call it instinct. The, the, the lion runs at, you've seen the, the clips, you know, on the Discovery Channel or something. The lion is running after the deer or some antelope in Africa. And we're saying, oh, is he going to get away? Gonna, and finally he catches one slow one and kills it, you know, it's horrible. But there's no karma for the lion or the, or the tiger. That's their nature, you know. And after a lion's life, they'll move on to another life. And the deer that was caught or the antelope, they also just get a new body. Now, there's no death. 
Death is a big illusion, as is birth. But it's an illusion that uh, it seems very, very real to us when we are on the material platform, meaning when we've forgotten our spiritual nature and we're acting simply in terms of the sensations of this body and the mind which is fixated on the body. So this is uh, likened to an ocean full of all kinds of dangers. And the, the purpose of human life, and it does have a purpose, is to cross over that ocean, to overcome or end the process of transmigration and getting uh, suffering, birth, old age, disease, and death. And, the, the, and, and that is what the Bhagavad, teach, Bhagavad Gita teaches on every page. And so this knowledge, first of all, of what our real situation is, and then the knowledge of the means to escape it, you can see how important this is. That knowledge is likened to a boat here that can actually take us safely across this ocean to the other side. So the question is, uh, how are we going to take advantage of this boat? First of all, we need to get knowledge. And there's no better way of getting knowledge than reading Srila Prabhupada's books. This Bhagavad Gita has, has been uh, sold and distributed. It's now translated into 60 or 70 languages and has been distributed by the millions. We have one of the most, ex most uh, experienced uh, book distributors in the entire movement living in the temple now, Vijay Das. I met him first in 1983 when I went to Miami. He'd already been in the movement for four, uh, four years or so. And uh, he became so inspired by reading the Bhagavad Gita, he joined the, the movement, and shortly thereafter he began distributing the Bhagavad Gita and other books, Srila Prabhupada. And he's been doing it ever since. He travels all over the world, not now because of COVID, but he, all over the world inspiring people to uh, read the books, understand them, live the, the science, and give the knowledge to others. This is a, a great service. So the first boat that we, that we want to uh, appreciate is the boat of transcendental knowledge. And this uh, helps us to uh, appreciate some of these other boats that I'm going to talk about now. So the next one uh, is the human body itself. This is uh, spoken by Lord Krishna, not in the Bhagavad Gita, but in another uh, Gita called the Uddhava Gita, which is part of a longer book called Srimad Bhagavatam. In the 11th canto, uh, there's 12 cantos, the 11th canto is near the end, uh, Krishna gives his last instructions to one of his great devotees named Uddhava, a very intimate friend and confidant. And he expands on some of the same themes as the Bhagavad Gita. So here in this 11th uh, canto, 20th uh, chapter, verse 17, he compares the human body itself to a boat. So he says here, Nirdeham adhyam sulabham sudurlabham plavam sukalpam gurukarna dharam so he's speaking very strongly here, he's speaking to Uddhava and to all of us. The human body, which can award all benefit in life, and he's speaking of spiritual benefit, is automatically obtained by the laws of nature, although it is a rare achievement. In other words, we've been through so many other species coming, coming, coming up. This is real evolution. Not the body evolves, but the consciousness of the spirit evolves and it awakens up more and more until we come to the human form of life, which alone can uh, uh, allow us to appreciate uh, the, the, the boat of the body and actually cross the ocean of birth and death. This human body can be uh, compared to a perfectly constructed boat, having the spiritual master as the captain and the instructions of Krishna as favorable winds impelling it on its course. So imagine a sailboat, you know. And what do we need on a sailboat? Well, first of all, it has to be strong boat it's not going to sink and it needs a good captain to guide it and we need favorable winds to, to cross to the other side so the captain is the spiritual preceptor the master and the uh, favorable winds are Krishna's own words here in the Bhagavad, Bhagavatam and in the Bhagavad Gita and, other, and those words which are also repeated for the specific audience throughout history uh, by uh, Srila Prabhupada and his followers uh, and, and those who came before him. So considering all these advantages, a human being who does not utilize his human life to cross the ocean of material existence must be considered the killer of his own soul. This is called Atmaha. Now, the first lesson of Bhagavad Gita that the soul cannot be killed, cannot be die. As the Prabhupada would love to quote this one line of text 20 in chapter 2. Nahanyate hanyamane sharire which means that when the body is killed 
and, and he's on a battlefield, so that's proper. But in one way or another, where there's disease, old age, COVID-19, whatever it may be, the body will one day, the machine will one day stop functioning, and that's called death. So, um, so the, but the soul goes on. The soul is not killed when the body is killed. But what this means is, killer of his own soul, is meaning that you, you uh, lose your opportunity. And oftentimes, because of greatly sinful acts, you lose the human life altogether. We can go down. As Krishna says, 16th chapter. We can become a dog, a cat, or even an insect in our last life. And then we've lost our chance. You know? And then you have to wait, 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 wait until you finally come up to the human form of life again. So the whole idea here, and in many other verses, is that take advantage of the great opportunity we have been given. It's just like, you, you know, you get a lottery ticket, it's the winning ticket. Well, you, you, don't, just, you don't just, you know, put it into your, your, your packet and forget about it, you know, or just put it on the side. You, ta- you, you treasure it and you cash it in. So we've all won the lottery. We have a human form of life, and more important than that, all of us here are somewhat interested and some very interested in this philosophy and in achieving the goal of life. Now, what, what does that entail? Let me just, uh, you know, describe a little bit. The basic principle of life in general, whether it's animal, bird, beast, human, whatever, is to increase our happiness and decrease our unhappiness, right? Misery. It's, just, it's almost so obvious that you don't even have to state it. Any little ant, you know, is running around. If you threaten it, you know, you put your hand down. Uh-oh, danger, danger. You know, and suddenly they're in flight mode going this way, that way, or something like that. You know, or a bird is eating, you know, and then anything coming, any little danger, boom, flight flies away. So trying to maximize the happiness, eat something, find a mate, you know, ba- basic things. But it's some kind of pleasure. And the downside is, in the material world, is that there's always some un- displeasure. What, one of the things that happens is no matter how much you enjoy, it's temporary. You know? That's not our nature. Our, 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 our nature is like Krishna's. We're part and parcel of God. Now, what is his nature like? We can learn something about him by studying ourselves and vice versa. So he said uh, in, the, uh, in the Shastra, Ananda Mayo Vyasat which means that by nature, God is always blissful. Why not? If you're all powerful, why not be blissful all the time? You see? <laughs> and, you, and, and, and the misery and difficulty comes down to zero. That's what we would do, right? If we were God. So that's, the, that's our actual nature. But we've lost it. Our nature is, it's a nice little phrase you can try to remember. Sat chit ananda. Sat chit ananda. Sat means eternal. Chit means full of knowledge. And ananda means blissful. There's a verse, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchat Ananda Vigraha, describing Krishna in, in a book called the Brahma Samhita. It says the supreme controller of everything is Krishna, God, who has a form, Vigraha, that is eternal, full of knowledge, and full of bliss. Now, we are part and parcel of God. Therefore, our original nature is also Satchit Ananda. But just look at us now. We're not Sat. You know, this body is temporary. We may be 18 years old, we may be 72 years old, or in between, but one way or another, the body's going to come to an end. And when you look at how long the time lasts, it's just a it's split second. It doesn't make much difference. So we're not, we're not eternal, and we're certainly not full of all knowledge. There's millions of things we don't know, right? We're full of ignorance. And what about the Ananda? Uh, not quite. You know, little flickering happiness here and there, and we call this, oh, now I'm doing okay. But it's certainly not happiness that's unending and ever-increasing. We can't even imagine such a thing. But that's where we want to go. That's, that's the ultimate goal of life, is to bring the, bring the, the distress and the, and the misery down to zilch and the bliss up to infinity. It sounds like, a, like impossible. Well, that's impossible, so let's just muddle through on the material plane. But no, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, other books of knowledge, and the great acharyas who have come down say, no, we're living that. No, the actual reality is you can attain that. But you have to work for it. And so Krishna is, is giving us the formula. You can, get on the bo- you can take advantage of this boat, of the human form, by hearing from the captain, following the instructions of the captain, and taking advantage of these favorable winds. 
of the of the Vedas and the and the books that follow the Vedas that Krishna himself gives, and that's what this movement is all about. And in fact, just to expand the <laughs> analogy, Prabhupada compared this ISKCON society itself to a boat. It's very much like a boat because it's a shelter in the stormy sea of the material world. When you come here, it's a different mode and mood. You know, this is, we're not. This is not a place where where you know some kind of gross sense gratification is taking place. The center is obviously Krishna on the altar, and what are we we're chanting this this name? We're performing a sacrifice, and it's all backed up by the shastra. In other words, it's it's a it's a serious business, although it's uh, there's so much joy in, involved, and which is which is Lord Chaitanya's a gift. It's, it's not a process of yoga like he described in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Go alone. Go alone, you know. And even that is, that alone is is like <laughs> go alone to a sacred place, and just sit there, control the senses. Absolutely no sex life, and you know, uh, control the breath, and the mind. You know, fix the mind on me, and uh, you have to have the right, right seat because you're in the middle of a forest somewhere, and there's all of these snakes around, and you know, poisons. Rip. So you have to find a, a deer skin, sit on that. You know, which has you know, from a deer that's died naturally. And uh, so many restrictions. Now Arjun, in the sixth chapter, he says, I, I can't do that. He, you know, he, Arjun is so much quality, more greater, he's a personal associate of Krishna, he's saying, that's impossible. He says it's like tr controlling the mind in this way, you know, through sheer will, willpower, really. It's like trying to control the hurricanes. There's two hurricanes, never happened before, blowing up in the Gulf of Mexico right now. Two at once, you know, it's climate change. So I lived in Miami for, for uh, six years back in the 80s. And uh, we're very aware, you know, when it comes to the, the hurricane season, which is right now, what's blowing up in the Caribbean? Caribbean? Is something heading toward us, to toward Miami? By great fortune, by my great fortune, there was no serious uh, hurricane when I lived there. But the year I moved out, in 89, they had a huge one. I think Hurricane Andrew. And I remember calling up my friend, the president of the, of the temple, and said, Dharma, what are you doing about that hurricane? It's, I'm looking at the map. It's heading straight for you guys. Oh, you know, we're relying on Krishna. Okay. Uh, all righty. And so I was following closely what happened. And, man, the hurricane's coming right down. And, and it just veered off at the last minute. I swear. And went down south. They got a glancing blow, enough to get some money from the government to repair something. But uh, it's dangerous. It completely destroyed one um, air base. And they never rebuilt it. You know, in southern southern Florida, these hurricanes can be very destructive. So uh, Arjun is saying to try to control the mind by the sheer willpower, which is what Ashtanga Yoga does, is like trying to control the wind. It's impossible. So he more or less said, "It's impossible." And, and Krishna said, "Yes, it's very difficult, but by proper practice, you can." So Arjun says, "Well, okay. What if I what if I fail? Then what happens? You know, I've given up my 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 uh, home. I've left everything. I've come to the forest." And then I fail, so I've given that up. I fail this. I'm like a riven cloud. I have not. And so Krishna says, don't worry. In your next life, you'll take birth in, in, a, in a pious family or family of yogis. You can keep going. Which is very encouraging because it means it, it applies to Krishna consciousness also. Whatever we do in Krishna consciousness, just like you were in this, uh, this kirtan, right? That goes into your spiritual bank account, you know? I mean, even if you do nothing else, you'll take birth as a human being. And you'll, you'll look for a kirtan, you know, so you can be, get, begin again. But anything material you do, you may be a millionaire, a hundred billionaire, you know, you leave all that when you, when you go. And chances are, because of all of the nefarious activities that you had to perform to get that billion dollars, that you may suffer a lot, you know, in karma. So, uh, the, the process that, is, that is, has been given to us, this ISKCON boat, uh, you got the captain, and you have the association, and uh, we're heading toward the spiritual world. You know, anyone in, who, who gets in this boat and seriously takes shelter. Of course, we're always free to jump back into the ocean, you know, and it, that happens sometimes. But the, the opportunity is there. And, and if you take care, uh, shelter of this boat by trying to follow the instructions and, the, you know, follow that Krishna gives and the orders that the spiritual master gives through his representatives also, then you can stay on that boat and be confident of going to the spiritual world. So the, the human body is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a boat that we should take advantage of. 
Now, there's another boat that I wanted to share with you. A couple of more, actually. And one is, uh, this is a, a very famous verse. The, the Christian's lotus feet are a boat also. There's a beautiful verse in the 10th canto, which is all about Krishna. And uh, this verse is spoken by Shukadeva Goswami, who's a great uh, scholar, who's the speaker of the Bhagavatam. And he's speaking to a king who found out that he only has seven days to live. And so he, sa he stopped eating, drinking, and sleeping. And all he did, he sat down on the bank of the Ganges, and Shukadeva Goswami, and he just listened with rapt attention to this Srimad Bhagavatam. And he went completely, became totally realized and went back to God. So this is the 10th canto, so maybe it's day six or so, you know. And uh, there's this verse about the uh, lotus feet of Krishna. It's very, you can listen to the poetry. Even though you may not know the language, you can listen to the sound, how beautiful it is. Samashtatahi padapallavaptavam mahapadam punnayasho morare padam 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 For those who have accepted the boat of the lotus feet of the Lord, who is the shelter of the cosmic manifestation and is famous as Marari, the enemy of the Mura demon. The ocean of the material world is like it shrinks down to the size of the water contained in a calf's hoof print. Not even a cow's hoof print, but a calf. Their goal, those who are on this boat, is Parampadam, Vaikuntha. Parampadam means the supreme goal. Vaikuntha, the place where there's no anxiety. Not this place where there is danger at every step. So, Shri Shri Gonatai Ki Jai. Shri Shri Jagannapala Dev Subhadraji Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Giridhari Ki Jai. So, how, how can Krishna's feet, uh, lotus feet, be a, a boat? As soon as you talk about the lotus feet of Krishna, we're talking about the process of bhakti yoga. Lotus feet means that you recognize that you are the servant of that person, who's, whoever's feet it is. If it's spiritual master, the lotus feet also. Um, and that's, that service and that attitude of humble submission to uh, Krishna itself is the boat. In other words, the process of bhakti is really the boat. And, that, the, and, and you, can, you can feel the protection. If you're really situated in service and meditating on Krishna, especially through the chanting of the holy name, which itself is another boat, then uh, you can feel protected. Just like this COVID-19 madness, you know? I mean, who expected this? Nobody, you know? And suddenly everybody's life is, uh, is up, up, you know, uh, uh, turned, uh, turned around, and uh, there's a lot of anxiety. The economy is in a free fall, and uh, you're afraid of going out, getting the disease, you know. And so, how how do how do we experience this? It's been going on for months now, like since March or so, right? March, April, May, June, July, five months, and into six months. So, how are devotees coping with it? Those who are chanting Hare Krishna, seriously following these principles, it's not as it's not as uh, anxiety-producing. The devotees feel the protection of Krishna. They take advantage of the sangha that we can get, sometimes a lot of it through the internet. The main, the main idea is that we, we use this word vaikuntha. This is mentioned here, the parampadam. Vaikuntha is the spiritual world where there's no anxiety. Why is there no anxiety? Because there's no old age, there's no disease, there's no death. There's simply you and Krishna and service and that pleasure, that, that, that bliss that I talked about that comes from being connected to Krishna and not forgetting any ma anymore. Our, our position in the material world is unnatural for the soul. We're not meant to go through all of this old age and death and rebirth. We're not meant to lose our God-given consciousness and have some rudimentary consciousness, animal consciousness. All of that is teaching us that there's really no happiness here. It's an illusion. It's a dream. But there is a place where there is happiness. And, be, and out of the mercy of Krishna, he comes personally or sends his representatives. And so that there are opportunities to uh, go back to our original position and to experience a lot of that same sense of peace and happiness, even in this world, if we take advantage of the process and the knowledge that's been given to us. So that, that's what uh, the, the, uh, the boat of the lotus feet mean, uh, of, of Krishna means. It means that 
we, we don't have to suffer in this world. We just need, we need to cultivate the knowledge and the practice. They go together. And by, by practicing according to knowledge, your faith deepens because you're experiencing it yourself. Just like, you know, on Sunday we'd often have a full house here, a big kirtan, and you, can, and you get into it. And I, I, can, I know because, I, you know, when I first came around, it's just a, it's like a, just a big uh, relief from a, from a week, weeks long you know, with some job or something, you know, and all kinds of anxieties that come. And you can sense that, there's the, that it's, it's, a, it's a different way of being. It's a different way of consciousness that you have. And then you realize that's the natural consciousness. That's our original consciousness, Krishna consciousness. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, 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 conscious, a, a, a mind full of anxieties and that, you know, needing relief. All, oftentimes without this knowledge you'll take some shelter of some uh, you know, drug or alcohol or something to try to forget the troubles. And it just makes it worse. You know, you, 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 you ruin the, the, the human intelligence, which is really the defining factor. And so, uh, but Krishna consciousness, you can never have too much. You can have long kirtans go on for hours, you know, and you come out of it just blissful and Krishna conscious, you know. Whereas if you have some long bout with some drug or something, you just come out of it miserable and damaged. So this is another boat. The boat of the lotus feet of Krishna. And you're not mutually in, you know, exclusive. You get on the boat of Iskan, you get take, take up the boat of, of the knowledge and Krishna's lotus feet like that. Okay. There's a couple more boats. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, in this, this, this Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, is very rich. It's, it's 12 candles long. It's like 18 volumes. And one of the, near the end, in the 12th canto, there's 12 candles. I worked on this book in the 80s in, in Miami. There's one whole chapter just on the different kinds of annihilations that there are in the material world. There's no destruction in the spiritual world. There's nothing like that. But here in the material world, we're con under the control of time, which is a kind of manifestation of Krishna. It pushes everything along, you know. And due to this time, there's various annihilations. One, of, one of, this, of, of those annihilations is our own death, which we're all going to go through at one time, you know. Uh, and again, of course, we'll get another body. But then this whole earth gets destroyed, the whole universe gets destroyed. There's different kinds of annihilations. So after this rather sobering chapter, he describes this, this verse, that this is samsara sindhum, the ocean of samsara. He says, samsara, this is uh, Shukadev speaking to Purikit again. Samsara sindhum ati dusta damuti tirshor nanyak pavo bhagavatak purushotamasya lila akatavasanishevanam antarena for a person who is suffering in the fire of countless miseries in this world and who desires to cross the insurmountable ocean of material existence, there is no suitable boat except that of cultivating the taste for the narrations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's pastimes. So there's nothing that absorbs you more in, in, in uh, thinking of a person than hearing about their activities and how they manifest this quality. This is why movies about heroes, and then when I was growing up, we used to read so many novels. I remember Dickens, you know, you get so absorbed. I remember one novel was about this, you know, he, he would write about the, uh, the Industrial Revolution in uh, England when he lived, you know, the 19th century. And there's this one, was one little girl named Nell, you know. A little Nell was the title of the whole, you know, thousand-page novel, you know. And how she went from here to there, and had so much suffering, and I think at the end she dies. I was crying. I remember I'm sitting there, I was about 13 years old, writing you know, my, my book review. I had to write. And I got completely absorbed. You know, these novelists, they can describe so well. So, but, you know, on the ultimate issue, it's all Maya. It's all Maya. <laughs> you know, involved, whether it's some, somebody in a novel or in a movie or in so called real life, it's still just the play of Maya because it's all temporary. You're passing through a certain stage, and then it, 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 it's over, and then you go on to another. But if you're hearing about the pastimes and qualities of Krishna, that's real. That's reality. And our, that, all that attraction for other experiences and other people and other things, that you're, you're completely focused on the material energy, that has to be sublimated into attraction to Krishna. And there's no better way than hearing about Krishna's pastimes 
So therefore, I took some of them and I put them in a little poem. So the most attractive of Krishna, by the way, he appears in diff different avatars. He expands in so many. Uh, but the most attractive, all attractive, is Krishna himself in Vrindavan, you know, playing as a little, as, as, as a cowherd boy and interacting with his friends and, uh, you know, the, cow the cowherd girls, his parents like that, and the cows. And so many adventures when he appeared on earth because he had enemies. You know, there was this demon named Kamsa who was always trying to kill him. He would send these shape-shifting shape yogis, you know. They would come as a big snake. They would come as a beautiful woman who was really a witch and uh, all kinds of things. And, they, you know, powerful and vicious. And he would kill them all. So that's exciting to hear. So, but uh, one of the most attractive is just Krishna going out in the forest and, and playing with his friends and herding the cows and the gopis at home, you know, pining after him and, and doing their duties, you know, churning the butter, but also thinking about him. So, uh, Here's, here's, a, here's a, uh, a couple of poems based on the, those pastimes. So the first one is Krishna's just entering the forest and it says, With lovely peacock plume upon his head and fragrant flower placed upon each ear, he enters brother's woods with graceful tread and handsome, handsome dancing actor without peer. His golden yellow raiment brightly glows, his splendid garland reaches to his knees and from his luscious lips the nectar flows and fills his flute with charming melodies. As Krishna thus begins his blissful day with coward friends who sing his glory sweet, he beautifies Vrindavan's forest way with fine impressions of his lotus feet. Now that's just words. Of course we have paintings and we can have background music, something we put on plays, whatever we need so we can get absorbed in these pastimes. So Krishna's now, he's now out in the forest. Now he's running with Balaram along the, along the beautiful Yamuna River and uh, this is a, another pastime. Let's go, said Krishna, don't delay at all. And he and Balaram began to run ahead of all their coward friends who called, Oh, Krishna, Rama, let us join the fun. And off they ran to Bridges forest haunts to play in every bower, grove, or sword. The bo a sword is a meadow. It's not a sword, it's a sword. <laughs> to play in every bower, grove, or sword. The boys would tease their friend with playful taunts, forgetting his position as the Lord. Sri Krishna is inviting us as well to join him in his pastimes which enthrall. The wise heed Krishna when they hear him tell, let's go my friends, do not delay at all. And finally, so now they're out in the forest and they're in special pastime, they're swinging, swinging Krishna. They, they got a little natural swing from a tree. For Krishna has a multitude of friends, a festival of joy each day would bring. A special thrill in Braj's forest glens was riding with him high upon a swing. O Ujjwala, Sri Dhamma, Badrasen, these are Krishna's friends. O Ujjwala, Sri Dhamma, Badrasen, just see Vrindavan's bountiful delights, the peacock's dance, the songbird's sweet refrain, the lakes and hills and other scenic sights. All these make this the best place on the earth for us to play all day and herd the cows. Thus Krishna, in the mood of sportive mirth, enthused his friends while swinging from the boughs. And this is just my little, you know, effort at poeticizing. The books of uh, the Goswamis and the ba Srimad Bhagavatam is the original. has so many beautiful descriptions of Krishna's uh, Leela. And they include the name, the form, qualities, and pastimes. When you think of somebody, they have these four elements. Okay? Name, form, qualities, and activities. When you think about it, the first thing the police want to know, if there's some crime, who did it? What's the name? You know? You know? And if, if, they, if they can get the name, you know, then they, they're a long way. But if they can, well, what do they look like in a form, you know? Was he high or tall? Was, 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 what kind of complexion did they have? Was he fat, thin, like that, qualities, you know? And what did he do? What was the crime he did? The pastime. Name, form, qualities, pastime. So the same thing defines Krishna. Now, he has un, unlimited names, but, this, but the main name is Krishna. Because Krishna means all attractive, got all these attractive qualities. Remember that our goal is to take our, sublimate our attraction for things of this world into attraction for Krishna, the original. And so that attraction comes by seeing the deity and glorifying the holy name, the chanting of the holy name. There's, there's, there's a transcendental fact about the holy name that's completely inconceivable in our present state. And that is that the name Krishna is itself non-different from Krishna the person because he's God. 
That means that we can get all the benefit by just chanting this holy name. This is the jagya, or this is the process of the age. Both in Japa, Krishna says right in the Bhagavad Gita, Yajnanam Japa Yajnosmi. Of all sacrifices, I have the sacrifice of Japa, which you perform every, every morning. You're invited to come or do it at home. 5.15 to 7.15. We'll even put some probably beads. We have many, I have many beads at home just waiting for eager chanters. And so, but, but the main uh, way of chanting is through Sankirtan. And that's also in the Bhagavatam. Lord Chaitanya, he's Krishna himself, come in this age to teach us the process of loving himself. He's, he's teaching us the process of devotional service. And so he's uh, described in the 11th canto, the same canto of the, uh, that the Uddhava Gita is there, but it's another section. So what is the uh, avatar for this age? The, the, the yogen, these yogis want to know. They're asking this, uh, no, they're asking the yogendras. The king wants to know. So the answer is Krishna Barnam, Trisha Krishnam, Sango Pangas, Taparshadam, Yajyar Sankitana Praya Yajanti Hisumedasa. That the, uh, the avatar of this age belongs to the category of Krishna. And he is Krishna. And he's always chanting those syllables Krishna, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, describing Lord Chaitanya. Right in the Bhagavatam, which was written 5,000 years ago, Lord Chaitanya lived 500 years ago. So, Krishna, Twisa Krishna, his complexion is not dark by Krishna's, but it's golden. Twisa Akrishnam. Saanga Upanga Astaparshadam. And he comes not al alone, but with his, all, his, all, his associates, such as Nityananda at Vaita, who today is a wonderful appearance day of his wife, Sita Thakurani, if you remember her. Uh, Astra and his, his weapons. What are his weapons? Well, we know Krishna, that he has this chakra weapon. He also sometimes uses a bow and arrow. You know, Ram certainly has the bow. Balaram has the club and the plow. Well, what does Lord Chaitanya have? His hands are open. Where's the weapons? The holy name. The holy name is a weapon. <laughs> doesn't kill you, you know. It kills the demon in you. The, the, in, in this Kali age, we have the saints and the, and, the, and the demons in one body. Notice sometimes you have like a kind of demonic side. And I, I'm not going to worry about all that stuff. I'm just going to enjoy. And then you say, oh, I should really do something else. You know, so there's, there's, there's a war going on in our heart. <laughs> so this holy name, this chanting of holy name, kills the demonic side and the saintly side comes out. That's a fact. So, uh, Sangha Upanga Astra Parshadam, Yajna Sankirtana Praya. For the most part, the way to worship this deity, Yajna Sankirtana, is through Sankirtan, congregational chanting of Hare Krishna, of the holy name. But, Yajanti, they will say, Sumedasa, one has to be t intelligent. So the most, most intelligent people in all of uh, San Diego are here right now and listening in over here. You know, because <laughs> they're, they're trying to cultivate their real nature. So uh, that, this is the um, way, by cultivating the attraction for Krishna's lila, which means attraction for Krishna's name and everything else, uh, this is a boat itself that will take us across. You know. And so finally, I found one more boat, and that is in the sec first canto. And it's a similar boat. This is a, this is a, a verse spoken by, I think, Narada Muni. Yes, he's speaking to um, King Purigat. No. Uh, he's speaking to Vyasadev, getting him to write the Bhagavatam. Eta dhyatara chittana matras parshe chayamuhu bhavasindhu plavo drishto. Plava is a boat. Bhavasindhu plavo drishto haricharyanu varnanam. It is personally experienced by me, Narada Muni, that those who are always full of cares and anxieties due to desire and contact of the senses with their objects can cross the ocean of nescience on a most suitable boat, the constant chanting of the transcendental activities of the personality of Godhead. So this is a, <laughs> no, this, that's a, a type of kirtan. So I'm just going to read this little purport here. It's very sweet. The symptom of a living being is that he can't remain silent even for some time. He must be doing something, thinking of something, talking about something. Generally, the materialistic persons think and discuss about subjects which satisfy their senses. But as these things are exercised under the influence of the external illusory energy, such sensual activities do not actually give them any satisfaction. On the contrary, they become full with cares and anxieties. This is called maya, that which is not. 
That which cannot give them satisfaction is accepted as an object of satisfaction. This is the material mistake. So Narada Muni, by his personal experience, says that satisfaction for such frustrated beings engaged in sense gratification is to chant always the activities of the Lord. The point is that the subject matter only should be changed. No one can check the thinking activities of a living being, nor the feeling, willing, or working processes. But if one wants actual happiness, one must change the subject matter only. Instead of talking of the politics of a dying man, one might discuss the politics administered by the Lord himself. In Mahabharat, Zolan, you know. Instead of relishing activities of the cinema artists, one can turn his attention to the activities of the Lord with, with his eternal associates like the gopis and the lakshmis. The almighty personality of Godhead, by his causeless mercy, descends on the earth, descends to the earth, and manifests activities almost on the line of the worldly men, but at the same time extraordinary, because he is almighty. He does so for the benefit of all conditioned souls, that's us, so that they can turn their attention to transcendence. By doing so, the conditioned soul will gradually be promoted to the transcendental position and easily cross the ocean of nescience, the source of all miseries. This is stated from personal experience by such an authority as Narada Muni. And we can have the same experience also if we begin to follow in the footsteps of the great sage, the dearmost devotee of the Lord. So it has been personally experienced by me. You know, the, um, the Sanskrit language, it's a, it's a great mystery for us. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's difficult to learn because it's, it's, it's uh, complicated and it, uh, there's a lot of grammar and stuff. So. But it's specifically designed, the Sanskrit, the very word Sanskrit, means perfectly composed. And it's, it's designed for uh, aesthetic expression you know and i'll give you a, a couple of, uh, of, of samples of that because this is what we need we need attractive sound vibrations that'll uh, that'll uh, you know entrance our mind and attract us to krishna otherwise we get spun out into the material vibrations so here's a simple verse from the krishna karnamrita this is a beautiful uh, book that was uh, discovered by lord chaitanya in south india he brought it back and he made it very popular it's world famous now but the, the, the Sanskrit is exquisite, and it's all about Krishna and Vrindavan. So one verse says, Madhuram, 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 Babadasya Vibho, Madhuram, Madhuram, Vadanam, Madhuram. Madhugandhi Madhusmita Meta Daho, Madhuram, 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 Madhuram. So the word Madhuram, which appears in there, what, ten times in the verse, is, uh, means sweet. So he has his meditation, he's meditating, you can visualize uh, Giridhari there. Sweet, sweet is my dear Lord's form. Sweet is still his face so fair. But his honey-scented gentle smile is sweet beyond compare. This is one verse. Uh, here's another one d describing uh, the holy name. You know, Radharani's appearance day is coming up. So we should know that when we chant Hare Krishna, we're addressing first Srimati Radharani with the word Hare. Hare is the vocative form of the, of the name Hara, which is the name for uh, the, the Lakshmi or Radharani. Why Hara? Hara means to take away. What does she take away? She takes away all her anxiety, takes away her misery, but she also takes away and steals Krishna's mind, Krishna's heart. Is it? She steals Krishna's heart. <laughs> Hara. So Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, uh, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And uh, Krishna, of course, is the supreme personality of God. All attractive. Everything about his pastimes, his form, his personality, everything is attractive. So this, this is a verse by one of our great uh, acharyas named Raghunath Das Goswami. And he's describing his experience while chanting the holy name. He's actually instructing his tongue to drink the wonderful beverage of the name of Radha and Krishna. So he says, Radheti nama navasundara sidu mugdam krishneti nama an excellent fresh nectar drink with endless subtle tastes, such as the name of Radha, by whom all three worlds are graced, condensed milk that is wonderfully delicious, thick and sweet, such as the name of Krishna, in whom all attractions meet. Now mix these drinks, O thirsty tongue, and add the fragrant cooling spice of love 
a prize the wise will try to buy at any price, and then in every moment drink this beverage most fine and make my heart supremely blissful, peaceful, and divine. So this is his meditation on the holy name. And of course we can't uh, end, it's getting close to the end, uh, without the verse practically the whole movement is based on. Lord Chaitanya's first verse of the Shikshastaka. Shikshastaka means eight verses of instruction. And it's all about the, 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 the uh, qualities, the benefits of, of chanting Hare Krishna and the goal, the final goal. So he says, Chetor Dharpanam Arjanam, Bhava Mahada Vagni Nirvapanam, Shri Akkaida Vachandrika Vatatanam Vidyavadhu Jeevanam, Anandam Buddhivardhanam Pritibadam Purnamitas Vadanam. <coughs> Sorry. Sarvatmasnapadam Padam Vijayate, Shri Krishna Sankirtanam. All glories to the chanting of Sri Krishna's holy name, which easily extinguishes samsara's blazing flames by polishing the lust-encrusted mirror of the heart. That chanting is the waxing moon that knows the secret art of causing the white lotus of good fortune to unfurl its petals far and wide throughout this bleak and blighted world. Of transcendental knowledge, which will take us to life's goal, the chanting of the name of Krishna is the life and soul. The ocean of ecstatic bliss floods far beyond its bounds, wherever Krishna's merciful and mystic name resounds. Indeed, whenever Krishna's names are sung in congregation, at every step one tastes a joy that knows no limitation. So here, with great attention, as I earnestly request, please chant Sri Krishna's holy name and be supremely blessed. The soothing nectar of the name will bathe your consciousness, bestow pure love for Krishna, and eradicate distress. And this is just one verse and the Shikshastika, which we don't have time to go through. But these uh, vibrations and this instruction, this knowledge, the boat of the lotus feet of Krishna and the other boats that we talked about, we should take advantage of them. It's as our, we have, Srila Prabhupada worked so hard to establish this movement and, 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 be, and bequeath it to us, you know, and now we have an opportunity. So, uh, we have our classes in the evening. Now you can get them online. Or if you're all masked up and everything, you can come. Every uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 7.15 p.m. We can go for an hour discussing Bhagavad Gita. We're just finishing up. We're going to start again. Uh, you can get it on the ground floor. And uh, <laughs> I've been through, I don't know how many times. I've been here 30 years. So I've been through about five or six times. But it's ever fresh. You never get tired. Never get tired of Bhagavad Gita. There's always some new... Th because it's dealing with essential things. You know? I mean, how can you get tired of hearing that y you're an eternal blissful soul, you're not the body, and here's how you can realize it. <laughs> it's always e ever fresh. And so, uh, you know, and of course we have our Sundays and the books. The books are all important of Srila Prabhupada. So any questions on, this, on some of these points? The, uh, take advantage of the boats and cross the ocean of birth and death. It's what uh, this movement is all about. Okay, I'll give you one or two more poems and then let you go. This is, this is one by Lord Rishabdev. It's inspired by him. I can't say that it really follows perfectly closely. Lord Rishabdev is an incarnation of Krishna who spoke some very important instructions in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam. And one of them is Nayam De Hode Bhajangaloka. He's speaking to his sons. He has a hundred sons, and then he's going to take sannyas and go wandering. So basically, he says in the first verse, uh, Don't waste this precious human life, dear friend, by working hard for hoggish happiness. Through bhakti yoga, worldly life transcend and learn to taste divine love's endless bliss. This is a universal instruction we give. And finally, the one one uh, verse about uh, a prayer. Let's see. Oh yes, a prayer from Queen Kunti, a very exalted Vaishnavi, female devotee in the Bhagavatam, chapter eight of the first canto. Her prayers are there. Very, very advanced and beloved of Krishna. And so, when Krishna is leaving finally to go back to Dwarka, she knows she won't see him again. The, the war, the, the war is over. The big, you know, her sons have, have prevailed. And she's bidding him farewell. And near the end, she says this. She says, O Madhava, please ever fill my mind with thoughts of thee, not any other kind. As Ganji's torrent flows into the sea, let all my love flow constantly to thee. 
and any of us can offer that prayer to Krishna, the deities. Thank you very much for your attention. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.